What is up booktube, it is Monty, and today I'm back again once again with another video. And today I'm here to go over all of the things that I finished in the month of March. A couple of these things I started outside of the month of March, but this is where I finished them, so I can talk about them here today with all of you. These are going to be mostly in order, and uh, that's just how we're gonna we're gonna do it. So the first book that I finished in the month of March was The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. This is pitched as an adult fantasy grimdark situation. This was actually my Patreon exclusive for the month of February. It's what they voted on, it's what I read. And I did not like this book. I didn't think that any of it was particularly dark, let alone grim. One second, actually. I just remembered that I was watching Aaron sprinting and I hadn't muted it. So hopefully when the sprint is over, um, I won't be interrupted. But I didn't think it was particularly dark, didn't think it was particularly grim, didn't really think that there was much of anything to follow here. The characters were boring, the, their motivations were boring. You could very clearly see that this was a setup novel and so how this is a trilogy. Don't really care. Don't really care if the things get better because I don't think that, um, I don't think that he really cared. I don't think Joe really cared about the progression of his story or where characters were going to go. And um, I don't care that it was written like 16 years ago. This is an older title and it very much read like an older title. And it didn't really read like a title from 2000. It read like a title from 1963. So, and, and 63 is being very generous because it really could have come out in like 1910. And aside from like the, the bits about like the growth, like the parts of the book that were written to like obviously make the reader go, oh, this is disgusting. Oh, this is a little, ooh, we're towing the line. I think that in the year of our Lord 2022, like those things just did not hit in the way that like maybe fantasy readers thought they hit and when it was published in 2005. And, you know, big props to Joe, but this was just, it was boring. It wasn't good. And I don't recommend it to anybody. Uh, you're not going to listen to me because this is a beloved fantasy author and it's a beloved fantasy series. I don't think that Robert Crombie himself was a bad author. I think that he could write something good, but just this wasn't it. So I know recently there was an announcement of him doing something new. And I think that I would read a book not set in this world um, because I don't, I'm not invested enough to try and keep up with that. But if he were to do something outside of this world, I would look into it. But this just wasn't it. Just wasn't it. It just didn't didn't slap. Then I read The Grace of Kings by Ken Liu. And you guys, I expected to like this book a lot. Again, I read this for Patreon. So they have a vlog. My memories of this book are pretty much non-existent if I'm being very much, if I'm being honest with you. I didn't hate it. But it was, again, something that I didn't care to continue on with. And the book itself ends in a place where I don't think you really need to. I think it ends in a place that is very satisfying if you don't want to continue on. There was a single character that I cared about, and that character died like 50 pages before the end of the book. And so for me, it was really easy to just not continue. This one, we are following a rotating cast of characters as they, the country that they're living in goes through a revolution and one of the characters like comes into power and how that power kind of corrupts this person that we had seen, you know, from a child into now this grown man. And it was interesting in that, but moving beyond that and into conflicts that would arise in a four book series, I don't think that I'm invested in it. I enjoyed it more than The Blade itself, but not more to tell everybody and their mother to run out and read it. With me finally getting caught up with my February Patreon picks, I moved on to my February, uh, yeah, this is the month of February, the, the book we had to read for the live show, and that was The Final Revival of Will and Nev by Donnie Walton. There's a live show, there's a vlog where I read this for the first time, so I'm not going to get into it too much here because this was a reread. Again, it was a 5 out of 5 stars. I listened to the audio this time, and I still don't fuck with full cast narrations, but, you know, if you do, you can go ahead and listen to this. I love it. I love Opal. I love Nev. I love, I do not love Nev. Let me not, let me not lie to y'all. But I love Opal. I love our narrator. I love the journey that the narrator goes on. I think that it's, it's what um, Evelyn Hugo wanted to be. It, it's, it's more Evelyn Hugo than Daisy Jones, even though, again, it's about like 
a band or whatever. But I do think it's this is what Evelyn Hugo wanted to be when she, Miss fucking Taylor Jenkins Reid decided to put Monique in the center of the story. And I think that this centers the actual person who needed to be centered and not fucking... I don't really care about fucking Evelyn. Like, Evelyn being the center of that story is wild to me. But, um, yeah, this is just a much better version of that. And I enjoyed it a lot more. Then I read People Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. And I did a little video. And I hated that book. You're not going to convince me it was a romance. You're not going to convince me that it was good. And you're not going to convince me to read anything else that Emily Henry writes as an adult romance author. Wasn't good. Didn't like it. Don't recommend it. I'll leave a link to that vlog in the and up in the up in the cards. Then I started reading the Patreon pick for the actual month that we were in. So my Patreon pick for March was Cherish Farah by Bethany C. Morrow. This is an interesting book that I still don't know how I feel about. The first part of this book is so clearly a five-star read. And at the end of the book, I had enjoyed my time here. And I think of all the things that I've seen compared to Get Out, I could see Jordan Peele doing something with this. I think that what Bethany did here is something that I could see in a Jordan Peele movie. It, it felt cinematic in that way, and it felt very tight. How I would go about telling other people to read this, I don't know. Because I did enjoy it. And I did like it, and the experience that I had was ultimately positive, but I think that your mileage is definitely going to vary on this one. Everybody is not going to love this one, and how to pitch this book, I couldn't even begin. So I will let you read the description, but I do think that the description of the book on Goodreads is a little bit off, but... Once you start reading the book and you start to see the breadcrumbs, I do think that Bethany C. Morrow does a really good job of leading you down the path that this book is going to be. I would not say that this was particularly thrilling. It was very unsettling, for sure. And it was a little, it was like a, a, like a sprinkling of horror, but not like actual, like I said, it's very Jordan Peele. So this, I think, lives up to that for me. And I think that's all I wanted it to do. So on that level, it was successful. I will continue to read books written by Bethany C. Morrow because I just love them. Look at that. Can you imagine I just actually caught that? Then I started Beast of a Little Land by, I want to say it's Juha Kim. I want to say that's how you pronounce it. If it's not, correct me in the comments. This is an interesting book. I went into this, I got this as a Libro pick from, it was like sometime last year, maybe it was even 2020. Um, but this I thought was going to be a multi-generational story. And instead what we did is, is we follow a young woman named Jade and a young man born into a Korea that is being occupied by the Japanese Imperial Army before, the, before World War II for sure and well before the Korean independence movement and everything that happened following the fall of uh, the Japanese empire in at the end of World War II. And we are just following these two characters. We get to see them from young children. We The first part of the book is really Jade's story. So we see her being brought to a courtesan and being sold to this little courtesan school. And this was something that I was reading after I had just finished uh, 50 Words for Rain, which also involved a very similar storyline. Um, but I do think that Jade's story was not as depressing. It was a little bit happy, a little bit happier. Um, and so we get to see her. She's training to become a courtesan and her forming this friendship with this other little girl there. And this, it was a really, it was a nice little moment. And then things change and she eventually finds her way to Seoul, which is where she meets the other perspective, uh, this little boy. And we see as their stories um, intertwine and these two characters come together and fall apart and come back together over the course of many, many years. So we get to see the end of World War II. We get to see, um, you know, the, the March 1st movement. We get to see um, Korea moving towards an independent Korea again. It was just really, really good. And the writing was just great. I ultimately wound up giving this four out of five stars because there was something that I didn't think clicked. I did think that as the book went on, the chapters started to feel a little, a little like we were just jumping to the next point in time. 
um, and it was kind of robbing it of that emotional impact that like when we when I was reading about the March 1st movement in the book I had no idea what it was and so to see that in the book I thought it was like really an emotional I think that the the heartstrings are really pulled in that moment and then I went and I got to read a little bit about it and so I do think that some of the later chapters were robbed of that same emotional depth because we weren't uh, because we were kind of like speed running through history and the book itself ends on this really just like bittersweet time and it was just it was great it was a great time I read it over the course of the entire month because I originally planned to read Beasts of the Little Land for my patrons um but that video just went a completely different direction you know it's not where I thought we were gonna go and so I took my time with it and I also think that added to my enjoyment because I wasn't just speed running through it I was able to enjoy it in in the pockets of my time and I just I did enjoy it I four out of five stars can't remember can't recommend it enough and I did listen to the audio so I do recommend that then I took a detour into some nonfiction because that's what I wanted to do and so I started this detour with blowout uh, corrupted democracies rogue state Russia and the richest most destructive Industry on Earth by Rachel Maddow. I originally took this detour to this book specifically because Russia had decided to invade Ukraine. And I said, you know what? I have a book about Russia. <laughs> it's so tangential. But I said, I have a book about Russia. I could read it. And so I read it. And I have to say that having read it, um, I, I do think that it put the the reasoning, the motivational factors that are going into play into the Russian invasion of Ukraine into play. And I did give this book five out of five stars, even though this book was written well. Well, I mean, it was written after Russia had, you know, forcibly annexed Crimea, but before they had invaded <laughs> the rest of Ukraine. Um, and I do think, like I said, it did give some perspective to that, but it is just a more total. I don't know why I said total like that. It looks at the oil industry in a more global land, like a, a more global lens. That's what I was trying to say. And so it was, it was interesting. My biggest criticism of the book was that I do think that there was some kind of, like, I enjoy a little detour, but I do think that Blowout did the detours a lot and they didn't always circle back to a point that I thought was being like really reinforced by the detour that we went on and if another author had written this I might have been annoyed um but otherwise like I said five out of five stars I do think that it illuminated some aspects of our current global climate and um I was able to learn things that I hadn't previously thought of which is why I continued on my Rachel Maddow dive and I read Drift the unmooring of America's military I think that's the subtitle not looking at it. the cover's over here somewhere and this is a look at how the use of the U.S. Armed Forces, the U, did I say that correctly? The U.S. Armed Forces has drifted, haha, you see the title there, from the framers' original understanding of how America would declare war. And um, I don't know if anything in this book was like totally revolutionary or game changing to anybody but me. Um, I knew some of the things that were discussed in this book. But there were other things that I had never really um, looked into. Like, I hadn't really looked... Like, I know that America had gone to war in the past. How we had gone to war, I had never really thought about. Um, and I do think that living... As someone who was born in 1995 and has lived through a lot of, you know, American military activity just in the my existence, I don't think that how... Um, I think that I was definitely using my current, like how I've just experienced the U.S. using military intervention um, as sort of like the blueprint for how we've used it in the past. And I just assumed that's how it was. And it never really occurred to me that there could have been a time that it wasn't like that. And so I do think that it it illuminated on those times and how those times were different. And it, it made me look at some of the movements that were happening around those times a little differently and how though how some of those movements would not have been possible had we gone to war at that time the way we had before it was really interesting would recommend it it was a significantly shorter book than blowout and it was much more focused there weren't as many detours and distractions it was very much just a we're gonna start at the original 
framers' intentions and their comments on how we would do this thing and how for, you know, hundreds of years of American existence, that's how we did it. And then you can kind of see the slow unravel. I wouldn't call it unraveling, but you can see how things started to drift further and further from that um, initial plan, if you will. So ultimately, like I said, I gave that five out of five stars. It was a good time. Then I said, you know what I want? I want to unhaul some books. And so I went to Half Price Books and I was listening to Drift and I was finishing Drift and I got to Half Price Books and I said, would you look at that? It was a beautiful moment. And while I was waiting to get my quote, you know, like through your books and they're like, you know, we can make pennies on this. So here's your pennies. I saw that they had a copy of The Red and the Blue, The Birth of uh, the 1990s and The Birth of Political Tribalism by Steve Kornacki. And I don't know anybody that looks as good in a pair of khakis as Steve Kornacki. And as someone who is a Steve Kornacki fan person, I said, you know what? Let me, let me, let me buy this. And so I bought it. And on my drive home, I started listening. And at first I was very upset that Steve Kornacki did not narrate the audiobook. But the person who did, they did a decent job. And I wound up giving this five out of five stars. Now I do think this is a little bit, um, it's a little bit misleading because it definitely starts before the year 1990. We definitely get a look into the politics of the 1970s leading into the 1980s and how the 1980s played into the 90s. But the bulk of this book, the real meat and potatoes of the book, is definitely how Mr. Newt Gingrich, he went to Congress and he blew things up. And I do think that it definitely acknowledges that there were elements at play that exploded in the 90s that had happened before, that this wasn't like a completely revolutionary concept or idea, but all of the elements of what you would need to make this strategy successful really came home to roost in this specific era at this specific time with these uh, people. And it does kind of bleed to like the year 2000, but it doesn't really go as far into the, you know, new millennium as it does going back. So we can see all of the power players and how the power players who would make a modern American politics, the way we think of modern American politics, the way they were. And um, again, if you're looking for something that is a good audiobook, I do recommend this. If you're looking for some political nonfiction, I do recommend this. And um, I'm really happy that I was able to to snag a copy and I didn't have to pay full price for it because I've been trying to pay full price for this every time I go to Barnes and Noble I'll be looking and Barnes and Noble don't ever have it so thank you to half price books then in my <laughs> continued desire to read some nonfiction, I read A Colony in a Nation by Chris Hayes another MSNBC contributor and you know what I don't work I I I don't regret it that's what I was trying to say this was the shortest of the nonfiction that I read this month, I think. Drift might have been, mm, I feel like Drift was still a solid eight hour audiobook. And A Calling to Nation is really just kind of an extended essay. And it's definitely a primer if you're looking to get into police reform or criminal justice in America. Um, it's very like babies first. Um, and I don't hate the book for that. I was definitely the primer that I needed in order to kind of they're like, you know what? Yes, I do want to read that. I do. I am interested in the um, expanding of these policies. And Christopher Hayes makes it very clear that he knows that this is a primer. And he references other books that are in this same wheelhouse that have more notoriety and uh, should definitely be read. And so I will at some point go and read those. I think I gave this four out of five stars five might have been a full five I don't quite remember but I do know that I had a good time and it was like I said it was like five hours so I listened to it at the end of my shift on like two times speed and it was perfectly fine again it's more a collection of essays than it is outlining any specific policy aims or history of it's a lot of you know anecdotal things which I don't mind um but again if you were someone who's already read a lot of, you know, criminal justice reform, prison reform, just the policing in America, the history of police, like that kind of a wheelhouse, I don't think you're going to get anything out of a colony in a nation that you haven't already read and experienced. 
And then the last book that I have to talk to you guys about is Bitter by Ikweke Amezi, which is the other book that I read for patron, uh, for patron, <laughs> for my Patreon. So they got a, I can't really call it a vlog. It was supposed to be a vlog. It just, it fell apart. But Cherish Farah and uh, Bitter by Ikweke Amezi were both reviewed on Patreon for the patrons. And I did not like Bitter. I didn't hate it. I did a live show for the Envy Book Club. So I'll leave a link to that discussion up in the cards. Full disclosure, it's like two hours long, and we go on several tangents in the live show, but it was a good time, and I'm thankful to Jesse for having me over there. So like I said, link to that up in the cards, and probably in the description if I remember correctly, but didn't love it. I don't think this is a good place to start with a quick AMSE, and I think that we all agreed that to read Bitter, you do actually have to read Pet. Um, Bitter is supposed to be a prequel, but nobody in the chat seemed to agree that it worked as a prequel and that everybody who did read Pet first thought that Bitter alluded to things and uh, Pet set things up for Bitter. And so it does function better as a sequel, even though it's written to be a prequel. So take that into account if you haven't already read Pet, just don't pick up Bitter. And it's not that I hated the book, there was just at the beginning of the book, I thought that it was too intelligent for me. And then once I kind of like got my footing, I, I could follow what was going on. But I didn't think that what was going on was all that interesting. And I didn't, I wasn't invested. And I thought that a lot of what the book was setting up just didn't work. And ultimately, I was sad. So <laughs> I didn't like it, unfortunately. Oh, I also read that pretty much all on a live stream. So I'll leave a link to those reading sprints down below as well, um, because I, that's what I did. I read on a live stream, so you can get my thoughts and opinions there if you don't want to sign up for the Patreon. Um, but yeah, that's all of the books that I read this month. It was like 10 or so. Again, uh, The Blade itself, I know I started in the month of February, but everything else I read and finished in the month of March. Let me know down below how many books you finished, what was your favorite, what was your least favorite overall, how did you enjoy your reading. Thank you again so much for tuning in and for clicking on this video. It really does mean a lot to me. I will see all of you guys again soon with another one. But um, until then, and until next time, bye.